what I want to talk about is this concept of neurorestoration and the ability to use technology, specifically devices, to restore functions like vision and hearing and movement. And, and this is a particularly exciting time in medicine because neurology, which was a... My, my, my wife was a neurologist, and she said in the early days, one of the, the... The neurologists could come in and they could tell you, they could deduce, they were great at deducing what was wrong with you, and then they had a saying, they would say, diagnose and adios. There was nothing they could do. <laughs> you know, you have a bad brain thing and something bad's going to happen. That's not true any longer. There's been a radical transformation in neurology where there's more and more available, where we're thinking about curing blindness and, cure, and certainly hearing, and, and I'm going to talk about movement. And one of the things that's really exciting about this is, I think, reflective of the, of the, the Simons Foundation, is that this work depends on the uh, coalescence of several fields, all of which have come together, and all of the things I'll talk about depend on interactions among clinicians, among engineers, especially this new emerging area of neuroengineering, certainly computer scientists and mathematicians, and neuroscience, and it's this unification of these uh, fields and advances made in all of them that have made it possible, so I'm going to show you some things of people using brains to control computers. And one of the analogies I really like to make, and I apologize to people who have heard me speak a million times because I always show this, but, but the analogy I like to make is, is back to this device right here, which, I don't, does anybody know what that is? It's a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and a patient. So, so that's, that's, the, that's, an early stage, that's an early stage, that's one of the first cardiac pacemakers. And, it, and as, as many of you know, cardiac pacemakers went over a couple of decades from something looking like this to something that's a small implantable device. If you want to pass it around, I brought a case for it. This is a little bit bigger, but it's basically like this, an implantable device that goes in the chest. And now they have computers inside them that will decide whether or not you need to be defibrillated. Uh, Vice President Cheney had one of those in his heart, in his chest. But, but typical of the way uh, early stage engineering uh, projects go, there's a lot of stuff on the outside because we didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to do. So there are dials and knobs and, and, and signal. Uh, there's an oscilloscope, which now almost nobody knows anymore because everybody <laughs> uses a computer to look at their signals. But they used these, these they were on the outside because what people uh, would, didn't know how to stimulate. They didn't know how much, how, when. They didn't know what the signals would look like. And this guy actually has a couple of wires stuck through his chest into his heart, and they come out. They're just taped over, and then they come out to this cart that he had to walk around with. So this was the early days of pacing, and, and uh, this is about uh, where a lot of the field is right now, and is certainly where we are with, uh, with trying to restore movement. And as I said, I'm hoping over the next decades we're going to be moving out to devices that are fully implantable, uh, kinds of high-tech kinds of devices, but we're not there yet. So the kinds of technologies that are being developed are coming sort of in two flavors, those that put things into the nervous system and those that take things out of the nervous system. And usually when I say this, there's some engineer in the audience says, it's always got to be both ways. And of course it does, but we're not there yet either, I think. So, so putting stuff into the, into the nervous system is uh, usually done by electrical stimulation, and it's done for two reasons. One, to restore lost sen sensory function, and I'll show you in a minute an example of how you can help restore lost sensory function by stimulating the nervous system. And another area called neuromodulation, which is a, now a field has two very large societies, uh, and neuromodulation means uh, electrically stimulating the brain to bring it back into health. And, uh, and the deep brain stimulator that Jerry talked about a minute ago is an example. I'll show a video of that. Um, now, on the other hand, you can take, take signals out of the brain, uh, which I'm going to emphasize, and that, uh, that is called sensing or neurosensing. And uh, a lot of people know that it's used for diagnosis. Uh, you can have electrodes put on the outside of your head, and you can have EEGs done, and you can see if you have sleep disorders or epilepsy. So it's mainly used clinically, but we're going to talk about some more uh, specific kinds of use of these signals, specifically to take the signals out of the brain to bring uh, movement signals out to the outside uh, as a control signal or to, to actually tap into other functions. The other thing that sensing can do, is, especially in human brains, of course, is it can allow you to read out what's going on in the brain and, and answer fundamental questions about what's going on. And I just want you to keep in mind, although I won't emphasize it, that all of the things we're doing to try and develop devices are also giving us insights into the human brain function at a level we've never had before at the single cell level. So, and you'll see some examples of that. So <clears throat> let me give you the examples of getting information uh, into the nervous system. I think the big success story is the cochlear implant, which um, is uh, something that is, uh, for those of you who don't know, the cochlea is this little uh, snail-like structure here. There's uh, little hair cells that receive sound. They degenerate in most 
kinds of hearing loss, and but the nerves are still are still present. And uh, there was an idea uh, now 35, 40 years ago that somehow you could put a little uh, thread of electrodes uh, into the cochlea, the little spiral, and you could somehow activate those nerves. And although you only put eight, and there are really there are about thirty thousand receptors. In fact, you could and uh, you could get hearing out of that. And it was uh, our reception when we first started doing the work. People doing this work were said that this, said that this couldn't happen. You couldn't do it. But in fact, it does work. People who have this cochlear implant, where, where the sound is transduced through and sent through the skin and into the cochlea, uh, there are about one hundred and seventy thousand people now with cochlear implants who can hear. And they can talk on the telephone, which is a very difficult uh, sound processing problem. They can hear music. And interestingly, it takes time, which is probably evidence of brain plasticity and the ability to interpret surely a very degraded signal into something that uh, can actually be used for conversation. Another one that's uh, very early is uh, there are about, I think, six labs in the world developing implantable uh, uh, stimulators to return vision to people who are blind. Here's a little schema where there's a TV camera. It projects uh, the, the electrical impulses from the visual image to a small wafer about this size to the back of the eye, and uh, it stimulates the remaining fibers. And uh, although it doesn't, the, the few people that have had this, I think there are about 20 or 30 now, they don't see as you or I see, they see sort of phosphenes or uh, flashes of light, uh, like a movie marquee. But it's good enough that if you were in this room, you could tell there was something dark over there against all the white walls. So there's there's actually, you know, this is coming, but it's got a long way to go to get fine-grained, high-resolution images. Uh, but they're in human clinical trials. And then the other one that Jerry talked about, which is, uh, I think, the, the, the most remarkable success story of this technology, is, uh, is deep brain stimulation in which these two thread-like uh, electrodes, and here are those little uh, marks you see right there are metal bands that are stimulating sites. I think they're about a millimeter long. They uh, target a structure deep inside your brain called the subthalamic nucleus. If you think of little tic-tac candies, you've got two of them, one on either side, about two and a half inches into your head. And if you stick the uh, deep brain stimulator electrode into the subthalamic nucleus, when you turn it on, you can see this lady here with classic Parkinsonian symptoms, shuffle gait, tremor, rigidity. And you turn it on, and you can see it's remarkable. She's a completely different person. And this, again, I think I usually leave the number off. I like to ask an audience like this, how many people do you think are, who are told, you have Parkinson's disease, I cannot cure it, but I will do brain surgery, I'll put probes the size of a pencil lead on both sides of your head, stick it two and a half inches into your brain, and I won't cure the disease, but I'll help mask the symptoms. Would you have it done? And if you ask usually audiences of this type, how many people have had that done, the answers I get back are you know, 15, 20, 30 people, but there are more, actually now I think it's closer to 70,000 people that have had this kind of implant. And I use that as, uh, you know, the age of brain interfaces is already here in that sense that, that uh, we, we already routinely uh, put uh, devices into people's heads in order to help them. Is again, the mechanism just, there understood at all? Well, they thought they did when they first did it. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, as, as I think most things in science, as you look into more detail, that there's, uh, it's not quite clear. So there are those who believe that it, it is stimulating the key structures. There are people that believe that it actually blocks activity. There are other people that believe that there's a modulatory effect that, that comes over time. Mm -hmm. So I think, I actually don't know the latest story, but uh, I, I think you know, there's certainly some, a little bit of each, I don't know, part of it. Do you think that's a little too tentative, though? I mean, in, in the sense that um, the disinhibition the, the broader picture story, people would agree. The, the model that came out of Mail and DeLong's lab, actually, that, 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 that picture, yes, is sort of like an emergency brake that's uh, stuck, and that's why you're rigid, and you're basically turning off that inhibition. Yeah, I think that's the story. But in the details of actually what's going on, it's much more complicated. So just for this audience, I mean, yeah. the big picture is those. The big, yeah, there's a circuit diagram, and, uh, you know, so if you saw the circuit diagram, you could say, oh, yes, if you could you know, mess around with this structure right here, that would work. And it did. The, the, actually, the early days of basal ganglia function, all the circuitry was backwards. All the excitatory cells were inhibitory, and all the inhibitory cells were excitatory, and all the drugs that were based on that all worked, but for completely the opposite reason. So, <laughs> so, so now I want to talk about what, what we're doing, and, and, and I think we're, we're one of the groups that's looking at sensing neural signals. So I want to show you an example. <clears throat> and I'll just let you listen to the video game for a second. Again, this is a video. It's actually on the web. This is a young guy playing a video game. It's called He-Man. There's treasure chests here and goblins, and, you're, and 
gamers know that they're not, they have another name, but I always forget it. So the, uh, they, he's supposed to hit these treasure chests. So he's doing an okay job that, uh, you know, if you know any 20-year-old kid that's a gamer, that's not particularly great performance. So this is Matthew Nagel, and Matthew had a, uh, a, a what's called a C34 Asia, a complete spinal transection. He was stabbed in the neck. He has no connection between his brain and his, his body. Uh, because his spinal cord was transected. So he has this brain gate implant that I'm going to talk about in his brain. It's a small chip that's got 100 electrodes in it that uh, the electrodes are bringing the signals related to his intention to move his arm out to the outside that's being fed through a computer where algorithms are decoding it. And the decoded input is fed into a computer and the computer thinks it's getting a mouse input. And so he's playing that game by thinking about moving. So this was, this was uh, 2006 finding an early stage human trial, and I'm going to talk about sort of how we, how we got there and how we did this. Um, and just to remind, the, the field is kind of new and has a lot of terminology, and so you'll hear uh, terms like brain-computer interface for this kind of device, neuromotor prosthesis, or brain-machine interface, they're all about the same kind of thing. We, we call our uh, device BrainGate, the BrainGate neural interface system, so they're all the same kind of thing, and I'll explain what the parts are. Um, so why, why would you want to create a device that allows a person's uh, movement intentions to come out? Well, there are lots of people with paralysis, and paralysis is not a disease, it's a consequence of a disease. So you can have an injury to, uh, <clears throat> in the central nervous system that cuts the fibers that carry the motor commands from the brain down to the spinal cord. That could be a stroke in the brain stem, which is sort of the lower part of the brain here. Or it could be, like Matthew had, a spinal cord injury that cuts the spinal cord. And basically, uh, there's about a million fibers carrying information down from your motor cortex to the spinal cord in, a, again, about a pencil-lid thick bundle of fibers. And if that fiber bundle is cut, you, you can't issue voluntary commands to move your parallax. Uh, then there are a lot of other disorders that disconnect the spinal cord from the muscles. Uh, for example, um, ALS is a, is a disease, a degenerative disease, where the motor neurons degenerate, the neurons that go from the spinal cord to the muscles. So even though the brain can issue commands to the spinal cord, it can't, they can't uh, make the limbs move. And in another sense, you can actually even think of amputation as a kind of cause of paralysis, that you can issue commands, but you have nothing to move. So, so uh, all of these, and there's a whole list of disorders that I won't go through. The Christopher Reeve Foundation has said there's about 5.6 million uh, people who are affected with paralysis, that's a controversial number. It's, some argue it's smaller than that. But the number of people who are in the severest forms of paralysis, one is called locked in, where you can't move anything except your eyes, uh, is, um, uh, is probably only in the thousands of people. So uh, the, the range of paralysis ranges from minimal uh, inability to move to completely locked in and unable to move. You'll see an example of a woman who's not totally locked in but unable to speak and move in, in some of the videos I show. So in order to understand where we're going, and not everybody who's doing this kind of BCI research, brain-computer interface research, has the same goal, but our particular vision is to actually reconnect the brain to the external world so we can recreate actions of the arm and the hand. So, and when I say to the external world, I, as far as we're thinking, it's not only to outside objects like computers or wheelchairs or robotic arms, but also back to the muscles themselves. So that could be, that's when I say the external world. As far as the brain's concerned, all the things that it would like to target could be the, the arm, but it could be something on the outside. And our goals, <clears throat> sort of when, when you're trying to design something like this, is, is obviously the first uh, and most important thing is that it's safe, that you can put some kind of device that's safe. Uh, by our, our vision, of course, we want something that ultimately will provide the utility of the arm and the hand, which is this, the more you study what the arm and the hand is, it's really a remarkable device. It really does a lot of amazing things. Um, uh, it's, and that uh, th these kinds of uh, devices would be as natural to use as the arm. When you, you, know, when you want it to work, it works. You don't have to think about it too hard. It's always available, it means it's always on. That it would be reliable, long-lasting. So if you had a device implanted in your brain, you want it to last a while. If it lasted a week, that would be unacceptable. But the question is, how long does it have to last to be acceptable? So we have sort of on the, you know, more than a decade. Um, it has to be portable. That is, you can't have wires like the, the, the man with the cart uh, <clears throat> holding it down, so you can't really get around too easily. You want something that uh, will allow you to get around. And even cosmetically acceptable, that you want something that doesn't draw attention 
uh, to having many wires and things sticking out of your head, uh, which turns out for, for many people who are paralyzed, this turns out to be a, a big deal because they say the only thing I can move is my head, and I once I'm dig my dignity is in my, my face and my ability to you know to interact with people through my face. Try to meet this ambition is uh, there's a number of, of, of big challenges. So getting the brain reconnected either out to action, some kind of action, or getting it connected to the muscles raises some questions which I'm going to try to address, like what area of the brain would you go to if you wanted to get arm and hand movement? Do you know where to go? What signals would you use? What kind of brain signals are available? What kind of sensor could give you that signal? Uh, how would you make sense of those signals even if you could get them, because the brain is a complicated place with lots of electrical signals, and what technologies would you connect to? And just to give you an example, you might want to connect to a computer, to something, an assistive technology in, in uh, the world of people with disabilities means anything that helps you. It could be anything from an extended stick to a, you know, a computer. Uh, <clears throat> a robot, uh, you, you might want to connect up to robotic arms that do what your arm can't do, to an artificial limb, uh, if you were an amputee, or uh, back to the muscles, which would be a great thing is to rewire somebody. So I'm going to walk you through some of those and give you a little introductory neuroscience. So we've known for a long time, I think, where to go. The commands to, to for voluntary movement are well localized. Back in the 1870s, we started to gain knowledge that there's a strip about a centimeter or so wide that goes from the top of your head down to your uh, temporal mandibular joint, about like that, in a, in a strip. And that strip is topographically organized. It means that the, the first third is dedicated to controlling your leg, the next third is controlling your arm, and the lateral third is controlling your face. This is just on one side? Yes, on one side. So everything on the right side controls the left side. So it's, it's also crossed, um, which is the, the nemesis of medical students. They have to learn all those crossings. So there's another one on the other side. Another one on the other side, exactly right. <coughs> yep. The, the interesting thing, uh, is that uh, you'd like to be able to find this in an able, uh, in a healthy person or, or uh, even in a person with an injury without doing anything heroic to find out where their arm area of motor cortex is. And it turns out by you know, a, a fluke of the way our brain is organized that uh, there's a little bump right here in just about everybody. And that little bump, which neurosurgeons call the knob, is the part of the motor cortex that controls your arm. So we can just do an anatomical image on anybody and we can find out exactly where that is. And that's worked very reliably in all our patients to, to find out, uh, to find that, uh, John, that spot. What always impresses me is where, where how important the thumb is in this diagram. The amount well, of the cortex taken up by the thumb. Yeah, so, so actually, the, so this, this map in its detail is wrong, so Parth will get me from being too specific again. I don't want to go into it. But, but in fact, the whole block of tissue is interested in the whole arm. But, but uh, what, what Penfield meant when they stimulated the cortex and said what wiggled as they mapped is that it was very frequent to, it, and the easiest to get the thumb over a very large area. And that's because we do a lot with our fingers and there's a lot of control there. So it's actually a very complex organization. We can get back to that if, if people want to hear about it more. Um, so then it's a, what signal would we take? And uh, the, the brain puts out basically two kinds of electrical signals, one that looks like this and one that looks like that. And uh, the, the, uh, this one is called a field potential. Uh, if it's recorded from inside your head with a little electrode, it's called a local field potential. If it's recorded from just outside, it's called uh, an electric cortogram, or if it's on the outside of your head, it's called an EEG. It, it's simplistically, you can think of it as the input, is a reflection of the input. It's not correct, but you can think of it that way for the purposes of what we're talking about. In addition, there's this other signal, these spiky events. These spiky events are the output of single neurons, and the only way you can record those spiky events is to put a microelectrode, which is about the size of a hair, uh, up against a neuron. <clears throat> this is all roughly to scale to give you a sense of the, the tiny size. And when you do that, you can pick up these electrical impulses, and this is the language of the brain to communicate to its neighbors or long distances very rapidly, and that code is, is actually in the number of spikes that occur, and we'll, we'll actually get into that in a little more detail. Uh, in a bit. So, um, from the outside of your head, you can only record signals like this, which are sort of input, and they tend to be global. In, in a sense, if you think of, uh, if you were in the Goodyear blimp above a football game, it's like listening to the roar of the crowd, and you can sort of figure out it's coming from one side or the other so you know who's winning, but you can't really get all the details. These spikes are actually the details of what's going on, the details of processing in every system, whether it's hearing, thinking, memory, uh, <clears throat> movement, it's always the same code. It's always used in the same way. 
And these, uh, so, so neurophysiologists who study the nervous system spend their whole lives listening to the pop, pop, pop sound of these things. In fact, I'll even play some. So that kind of crackling noise is, is the popping of these potentials. I show them in this other format because this is the way we often look at them. And you can see the spikes. This is going by uh, very fast. You can see these electrical potentials. Each, that tall one is from a single neuron. And I just spread it out in time here because I'm going to show you a picture later from a human that just shows when you take one of those spikes and stretch it out, that's still a spike. It's the same thing. So those are the signals. And what we know from the, and again, this is uh, started with the Evarts group and uh, with uh, Don Humphrey and, and Apostolos Georgopoulos, and pretty much all of their students have, have led to the understanding of what goes on in the arm area of motor cortex with spiking when you move. So one of the first pieces of evidence was based on this. So oh, let me tell you, that, so all of this comes from basically having monkeys play video games. And, and so here's a monkey playing a video game. We give them this kind of a thing instead of a mouse, because if a monkey has a mouse, they just throw it off to the table. So it's sort of bolted down on a tabletop. And they get these games, and one of the games is there's a dot in the middle, and a target appears, and the monkey has to move to the 12 o'clock position, or next time maybe to the 6 o'clock or the 3 o'clock, and they just move in this. So what that does is it varies direction of the arm reaching movements. So the first thing you notice here, so each one of these little tick marks is how that cell spiked on an individual trial. There's just lots of trials here, and they're summed up here. But all you have to look at here is that that cell fired before the monkey actually started to move. So that's why we believe that the motor cortex is the place that actually gives the command to make you move. Then, particularly the work of Georgopoulos said, OK, now let's look at what happens to that firing of that neuron as the monkey moves in each of eight directions. And what he found is fires a lot more in one direction than it does in another. So this is just mapped the same way as those circles on the clock up here. So they, they move in one way. They, they fire more in one direction than they do in another. So they're, they're directionally tuned. And for the mathematicians, they fit a cosine pretty well. So, um, so, so this directional tuning says that we've got information about which way the monkey is moving in advance of the actual movement from the spiking activity. And now there's a whole bunch of other things that we can get out of the, uh, out of the arm uh, activity, and I won't talk about those, but just remember you can get things like, like uh, the direction of movement out of those cells. What's the typical delay in the picture? How, how soon before the movement? It's about 120 milliseconds. So you begin to see the peak, the rise in the, in the discharge about 120 milliseconds in advance. Some cells are a little later, not many are earlier unless there's planning required. If you require planning, then it can go way out. Is the delay because the muscles aren't re reacting, or is it the delay inside the brain itself? But yes. <laughs> so so it's, it's all of those. Uh, so, so some of it is the amount of time it, it has to propagate, which is about, for, for the cells that go directly down, about 12 to 15 milliseconds, mm -hmm. very fast. Then there's a transduction to the alpha motor neuron, and then out to the periphery, and then it has to recruit the muscle. The muscle has to contract, and so that, then pull the limb, and you actually have to see motion in the limb. And then there's some, some rumbling around inside your head as well, I think, that uh, you know, it takes some time to do that. It, it's amazing I, I, that, that every study agrees on this sort of about a tenth of a second time to get from the start of this activity out to the outside. When does consciousness play come <laughs> Can we delay that? I, that, that, would, that? That would take about 10 years to begin to answer. but. Uh, <coughs> So I mean, are you I, conscious at the beginning of the spike? Or? So the evidence is, yes, you are. Yeah. But there are other areas active before that. And then the question is, are you conscious of that? And the answer probably is no. So um, but I, can, I can answer that after. There's a very good book you can read by Benjamin Libet called Mind Time. It's all about that. And it's really wonderful. I, I recommend it. So the, the thing is, we, we don't want to listen to just one brain cell. It's sort of like listening to the second uh, violin at the orchestra. You've got to listen to a, a sample of the nervous system. So, so we worked, and, and we hear, uh, this is a, an electrode array of 100 electrodes that uh, came out of Dick Norman's lab. And then he and I developed this into a technology that uh, was suitable for implanting for long periods of time in monkeys. But it actually looks pretty much the same as the day we first started working on it. So it has these 100 microelectrodes. It looks pretty big. But it's actually, it's four by four millimeters, and here's one hair-thin electrode. And I actually brought one with me. So last time I passed one around, somebody raked their finger over the end and broke all the electrodes off. And so it's only a demo, but I'll show it. But I just want to see the little black dot. Oh, yeah. That's it. So that's the implant. And that goes, that goes into the brain. It gives us 100 sites to record from. 
there are literally tens or, or millions of neurons engaged here, so we're still making a very small sample of all of those neurons, but it gives us many more than we had in the past to be able to chronically, that means over time, continue to record from those. In this sort of early stage system that we still use, the array is in the brain, it's in the cortex. Cortex is about as thick as an orange peel on the outside. If you spread it all out, it's as big as a large pizza. Um, so it's, it's this uh, cortex on the outside, that, and this would be the motor cortex. Cable comes out through the skull, and there's a, uh, a connector that's uh, put on, and um, there's a plug on the head, basically. And, and so we, like the early uh, cardiac pacemakers, everything comes to the outside, then we do all the processing, and you'll see a picture of that. So, um, so at the point where we had all this together, we had you know, our monkeys playing video games, and we asked the question, uh, you know, uh, if we really know what the signal is, if we could take, record the neurons, get them to the outside, understand what the signals are, decode them, translate them into a movement signal, that if a monkey was playing a, mi a video game and we understood these signals, the monkey should be able to play the video game with its brain. So that's what we did here. And uh, so here's the monkey sitting there. There's a signal, uh, uh, now the monkey's just playing the game, and the job of the monkey here is not that, that radial task, but there's a dot, whoops, I'll, I'll play it one more time. But the dot, the, there's a target that we put on the screen, the red dot, and the green dot here, uh, it is controlled by a mouse, and then the, uh, the job of the monkey is just to simply bump into that uh, red dot. Now, in fact, that dot isn't being controlled by the head. What we did was we unplugged the mouse, we ran it through the decoder, after we built the decoder, so it's going directly from the brain, all the computer stuff is not drawn here. And that uh, cursor is being driven by the monkey's thoughts about moving its hand, and it shows, certainly it's not as smooth as a nice smooth movement, it's got some erratic features to it, but in fact, it shows that the monkey can go right on playing as if he were using his own arm to play this, to play this task. And so this, was a, a, this, was, this is sort of vintage 2002. Is the monkey moving the thing physically as well? So in our case, so this is a big, yeah. So, so the, the monk, one of our two monkeys that did this actually figured it out that it was unnecessary. And monkeys being inherently lazy, actually, <laughs> they liked it. They just sort of sat there and didn't do anything. <clears throat> there, were, there were, you know, the other monkey still made movements of its arm of various kinds. But they, they became apparently, but not carefully monitored, uncoupled from the movement. Subsequently, other people have tied the monkey's hand down, but all that does is it tells you you don't, you don't know what the hand is actually doing because the muscles can still be wiggling. So it's, it's a controversy, but nevertheless, this, it shows the point of this was to show that, in fact, you could use the brain signal. We knew enough to make sense out of it, and we knew enough to have it go on controlling. So, so that was sort of the, the, that's the monkey, that was where we were with the monkey stuff. Are you going to talk about how you made sense of it? Yes. Yep. But I'm going to wait till I get to the humans. Did you find the monkey who stopped working to be more intelligent than the other monkey? I don't know how to judge monkey intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the monkeys that don't work at all might be the most intelligent, right? <laughs> so, 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 well, let, let me get to the human. No, uh, I think, um, I mean, it's a good question, but we, it just depends on how you, how you describe intelligence. Right. We, we just learn other tasks. If you could do learn ta other tasks, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's like people. It's very complicated. You know, some people are good at some things and not at others. So it's a it's a complicated story. So this is where I was going to gloss over the history of going from monkeys to people. But in fact, what we did is when we had sufficient data that we thought <coughs> that we had proven or had good evidence for safety. We had good evidence that the, we could put the, we had an array that we could record from, we could decode the signal, we had the proof of concept from the monkey data that we could in fact help people who were severely paralyzed do anything because if you're really severely paralyzed you rely on other people to do anything. And so we thought uh, we could now, so we, we started a company, so I won't go into great detail unless people are interested, we started a company we raised initially six million dollars with the venture capital we put all of that into taking the monkey device and turning it into a human device, which is here, the same array, implanted in the arm area of the motor cortex. Plug on the head, signals come out, spikes come out. We run that through a, uh, a decoder, which is over here in this card of electronics. Think back to the pacemaker, and then the thoughts would be turned into cursor motion, and we could get people to be able to do things that they could, they can't use their hands, but they could be using a computer. So that was our idea. I, I will maybe wait to the end, I go into great detail. 
we did form the company, there was this great idea of switching back and forth as, as the, the data about what was going on in the human brain would come back to the academic setting. The academic work would be drive product improvement and we would have a product out quickly. That didn't succeed. The company ran out of cash in November 2008 and that was a very bad time to run out of cash. As many of you know, there was no one interested in funding crazy ideas like this. But what would be the end to it? So just moving a cursor on the screen or this yeah. person would be doing all the things you could do on a computer? Oh, on the computer. On a computer, okay. yes. So the cursor on the screen is, is, is the mouse, right? Yeah. So, but I'll show you some other things that, that you can do with it. So uh, the, the trial began in 2004. The first we called our patients S1, S2, S3. I can use the names now because they're public. This is Matt Nagel, who you saw in the beginning. I may call them S1 and S3. This is uh, Kathy S3. She appeared on 60 Minutes. And if you uh, look on CNET and do a search on BrainGate, then you'll be yeah, you can see her story. It's a very nice story. So, so far we've implanted five people. All of them are tetraplegic. They can't move they, uh, their arms and legs. Uh, two of them had cervical spinal cord injury. So that basically, uh, they disconnected from their, their entire body but could speak. Uh, one of them had a brainstem stroke, S3 Kathy, uh, nine years before. And she uh, is unable to speak as well as move. But she can actually move her head and face, which not all locked in people, not all brainstem stroke people can do. Uh, and then there were two individuals in the study who were, had ALS uh, who were uh, unable to speak as well as unable to move except to make a few very modest movements like raise an eyebrow and in one case wiggle a finger slightly. Um, <clears throat> so, and we're in the process, oh, so I, I didn't mention, as a, at the collapse of the company we moved all of the clinical trial back into the academic setting which actually took a whole year to do, it's not trivial to do, with the FDA and the FDA has given us approval to do 14 more participants which is uh, underway now. So, oh, I hope this. Satisfy the requirement that it won't, it won't be obtrusive in some way. Is we just have to explain it to the people who get it about how obtrusive it is. It, it isn't particularly, it's a, it, the pedestal is about the size of a penny. It barely sticks up above the hair. Uh, that thing is standing up there and it's up. That's, that attaches. It's detached every time. I'll sh yeah, I I'll show you oh, again. Okay. Yeah. No, it's not on there all the time. It, it's like the cart, you know, to connect the cart. So I hope everybody's okay with surgery. But it's kind of, to be, you can just get a sense of that. So here's, this is actually Matthew's surgery, I think. The, the opening is about the size of a 50 cent piece. Uh, there's a, an array here. There's a little a pneumatic inserter and there's a video here that just taps it into the brain. <clears throat> to a neurosurgeon, by the way, this is a very easy, straightforward procedure, not very long. Uh, it's pretty, pretty, not much of anything goes on. There was the tap right there that happened. So all those electrodes are tapped into the brain. You can see not much happened. Uh, there it is sitting on the brain. That's just cardiac pulsation. And here's the array a little bit further back, the cable coming up over the skull. Here it is running over the skull up to the pedestal. So they're off, the bone is put back. They're all closed up. Uh, and all that's left in the future is their, their pedestal. So one of the big and most dramatic moments for us was these are people who have been years not moving their limbs. What would the arm area of motor cortex be doing? So I'll let you listen uh, to the activity and see the activity. You can actually see the spiking of the, of the activity as, as we asked, in this case it was Kathy, to imagine closing her hand, relaxing, and opening her hand. And, and this demonstrates that not only are cells there, but in fact as she was imagining these motions, you can, the easiest thing to do is just listen to the changes in the click rate but you can watch the spikes go by, which go by in slow time sweeps here and spread out like I showed before over here, uh, and then another time by here. But you can just look at the rate modulation or just listen. And there, it's most active when she's uh, imagining open and then least uh, when she imagines closing, so you can hear. Relax. Opening your hand. So you're listening to the thought of movement. Relax. Close your hand. <coughs> it should become silent. Relax. Open your hand. So you see, in the most simplistic sense, you can build your own little decoder in your brain. A lot means open and a little means cl close, right? Relax. So that, that's, it's actually not too, too far from that. Now the question is, how can we gain an understanding of the relationship between the intention and movement? So I'm not going to go into too much detail except that to say what we do is we, we, uh, we play a display like this 
And in this case, we are moving that cursor. And we have a target, they're going from the center out to the target, we're moving that cursor, and we tell the patient, you imagine that you're doing that. And simply by them imagining it, we see modulation. So here are the eight directions as Kathy imagined moving to these different directions. You can see it fires more over here and less over here. So we actually have directional tuning by imagined action. So we can take direction out. And what we do is we just take little snippets of activity and we do a, a spike count and we use that piece of information from each of the cells to get an estimate, a population estimate of what direction she's imagining. So let me just, I can give you a little intuition. Oh, this is just a hand-waving thing to say. This is sort of what we have to do. There's a, there's a lot of spikes coming in from a lot of neurons. There has to be some equation to get a command signal, but I'll, I'll just give you this intuition of what we're, what we're trying to do. So now, so this is a time sweep and there's some of those spikes occurring and you had a, just one cell and uh, I was moving to the left doing a recording from one of my motor cortex cells and as I, every time I moved to the left, the cell fired seven spikes. Every time I moved to the right, it fired two spikes. So now you have a code. Seven means left, two means right. And so effectively, that's what we do. We count the number of spikes in a small bin, and we use that to estimate. Now, the problem is the cells are not reliable. They're actually coding other things, and so they don't fire seven every time. It can be much more complicated than that. But by using a sort of principled combination of neurons, by adding many neurons together, we can get an average over a small time bin, and that becomes a pretty good estimate of which way, we're, which way the, the, uh, the person is thinking about moving. But it's only count? Uh, right now, we use count. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we only use spikes. We don't even use the local field potential, which is another signal that's there. So can you comment a little about the local field? I mean, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so in fact, we have just published a couple of papers and have a third one about to come out where we've actually looked at the local field potentials. So the, the, the local field potentials are kind of an input, but they're actually a more complex signal. They have a, there are many features inside the local field potentials. And what we see is there's, there's actually very good information about movement, and we've, one of the recent papers we published showed that you can take the lower or the higher frequencies, and you can actually extract movement information from those as well. As well as spikes. As you can, and, and if you combine all of them, you can see very, well, we'll talk about it afterwards, we use greedy algorithms, and you can see it's very opportunistic, it'll pick whatever signal works best, and it picks and it picks, and mixes. Differential between beta and gamma. Uh, yeah, let's talk about that later, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is just, uh, and again, I said, you know, I, I will not explain this. This is just, uh, for, for those of you who are interested, we use things like a probabilistic uh, filter that using Bayesian influence. And basically, I, I explain this kind of equation of saying, this is an equation that says, look, if you haven't seen this in the past, don't count it very much. And it's exactly the same principle for those, and I apologize to the mathematicians for this ridiculously simple thing, but it's exactly what the Airbus uses in fly-by-wire. It's got a, a Bayesian inference. It says, if you're in the cockpit and you're at 30,000 feet and you flip the control to the left, the, the math in the, in the control panel says, you didn't mean to do that, forget it. And so it discounts those kinds of things. So effectively, that's the way we've, we've taken these sort of noisy linear filters, and when a big burst of noise comes, it doesn't have a big impact. But it is very complicated to do. Um, and there are parts of how many people are now working on decoding as a general, I mean, it basically is neurophysiology is what it is, but the number of labs who are, and, and uh, people who are interested in this is in the hundreds now, I bet. Yeah. Could be, yeah. So uh, now I want to show you early control, and uh, this is a movie that's on the web, and, and many people have seen it, but I, I like it because Matthew is going to narrate it. Here's Matthew in his chair, uh, so he's completely paralyzed. This is a ventilator uh, to help him breathe. And uh, he's got this connection. So as whenever we do the session, which is usually a couple of times a week, he has this connector put on his head. The cable comes out, goes to a cart of electronics. The technician here, Abe, has set everything up. But as far as Matthew's concerned, he's looking out, and his thoughts about moving his arm or making a cursor move. So he's going to show you. Uh, we have a, a very simple, what we call an email program. So he just runs a cursor over the envelope, and it opens. And then he's going to draw a circle. So I'll, I'll just let him narrate those things while he does it. Okay, so here's the CyberKinetics desktop. What do you want to do first? I'm going to open my email first. Okay. Open the first one. You can open the first one. So he just has to sweep over that in this case. Congratulations, you are doing a great job. Very good. I'm going to open the second email. Okay. Says hi, and we'll talk soon. Great. 
And when you exit back to the Cybertronics desktop. So this is back in the company days, so it was product placement there, you can tell. <laughs> We're gonna draw a circle. Wow. So this is a little paint program, and you'll see that's an ink well and that's an eraser. So this is the world's first attempt to take a handful of neurons that usually control the arm and to try to draw a circle. So you'll see three attempts here. That was the first, and he hit the eraser. Oops. You avoided the eraser that time. It's a bad circle, like you don't go to that. Okay. You need to draw a circle. So this was a little bit later, I think a couple hours later. Excellent. Now let's try uh, going back to the desktop. So these early findings said that, uh, you know, this is, the, the surgery to a neurosurgeon is straightforward because it's on the surface. There were arm signals present long after paralysis. There was no learning required. We just had to learn to calibrate this filter. We had to take the signals that were there. We didn't have to train them to do anything. There were no special attentional demands. They didn't have to focus particularly. We could get continuous control. The mouse cursor could go around. And we had uh, sort of controlling virtual and physical devices, at least at a sort of crude demonstration level. Now, there's been a question about how long these things will last. And I just sort of mention it here in passing because uh, it, it leads into the next section a bit. But, um, uh, so in terms of longevity, I said safety was most important. We now actually have more than 10 years cumulative data and uh, it, that we haven't had an infection of any type so that, uh, that even having a percutaneous pedestal, which we don't want in the long term, a hole through the skin is not a good idea in the long term. So, but but uh, in 10 years of data, it's actually been very good. In fact, it's going to be written up because of the way we take care of it. We found a new way to sort of care for ports in the skin, which is important for people who have uh, these kinds of conditions. Uh, we, we've worried about, uh, and the problems are tissue reaction, mechanical uh, problems of yanking the array, moving it, technical problems, uh, and neural problems. After all, neurons that are recorded over many years and they're used in different ways may change their properties. So we've, we have hints at all of these things. One of the things I'm very happy with is that although absolutely the tissue responds, if you're gonna, you know, when you put something into the brain, you're going to damage it. This seems to be, for the technology we have, not a big issue. That's not the problem. Mechanical, we have had a problem with the array moving in one patient. Uh, uh, technical, there's been all kinds of things where a pedestal broke, uh, that is the connector on it broke. We had another one where the insulation leaked and declined in the quality of the signal. Um, and uh, so th those have happened. And I think right now we're, we're, we're interested in what kinds of neural changes have, are, might be occurring, but we're not addressing those. So, question, oh sure. Mm -hmm. The stability of the single units, though, over long periods of time, you're not continuing to record from the same individual neurons. It's very hard to make a convincing case as to what the same cell is every day, because when you pass those electrical impulses through the kind of filters we use, they all look the same anyway. So you have to come up with a set of criteria as to what it would look like if it was the same cell every day. So we have never done that in any careful way, but I can tell you I've been looking at some data lately and there are a couple of animal studies that say 30% of the cells last for weeks. In, in our impression, there are some properties of cells that seem to be around and be the same for months. But it's not, you know, has not been carefully analyzed. But you can at least tell in terms of the electrode, I mean, the current density around any given pin in your array. You well, we look at the sh that, that right, little the shape, that the shape. Right. but yeah. that shape, any, even when a refrigerator clicks in the environment, it gives that shape because that's the RC characteristics, for those of you who know electronics, tend to do that to impulses. So yes, I can show you waveforms that look the same over a long period of time, but is that really the same cell? If you're a skeptic, you can, you can you know, certainly shoot the argument down. That's something we're doing next. But it doesn't really matter. I mean, the, given the, or, the fine structure organization in the brain and the way that you're doing the decoding, it, it, it doesn't, what you're saying is that it doesn't matter. It just means we, we, we build a filter every day. Every time we have a session, we build a new filter because we say we don't know what we're dealing with that day. That's right. So that, that's a, actually an area of inquiry that needs to be looked at. How much do you have to rebuild? So I, I will show you. So over the, the couple of years, oh yeah. So, so what drives the number of needles in an array and the number of arrays in the brain? So there's 100 electrodes. It turns out because of the power of two uh, amplifier thing, there's only 96 connected. Uh, and we're only allowed to put one array in the brain, and that's because this was a pilot human clinical trial and we didn't know what the burden of this, so we wouldn't certainly want to put two of something that we weren't positive 
one of wasn't going to be completely safe. So we were, uh, you know, so we were allowed by the FDA to put in one, and I, I didn't push to go two. There are people now that are looking to put multiple arrays in because they don't find any particular problem with two. So are you allowed to do experiments in the sense, if I don't know if it's ethical to <coughs> involve these patients in other neurophysiological studies, they are doing tasks? Absolutely. You're That's what we do. So I'm going to show you some of that. So, so some of this actually, these are experiments. What is the best filter right. to use? So, so in fact, we, we now, uh, first thing we did, two years, so, so the, the point I was trying to make that I got away from a bit was that uh, the best argument for longevity is that it still works. So there, all these other things go on, but it still works. So I'm going to show you N of 1, Kathy, two years, three years, and five years of, of controlling the cursor. So here's uh, going out from the center, going out and moving to a, a target at two years. And um, uh, one thing we've done, the common filter that I talked about before, this Bayesian filter smooths things out a little bit. We've also been able to do what's called a state decoder, as she imagines squeezing her hand to click. We can actually pick that up too, and we can use that so she can now point and click to it and make a selection, exactly what you do with a mouse. And uh, so at two years, we decided, well, okay, well, let's pick a date, 1,000 days, kind of an interesting date, and we'll take five sessions around 1,000 days and just report how well she performed that task. So here's the 1,000 days. This is a paper that's now out. Uh, and uh, what you can, this is the percent correct. And you can see there are days when she doesn't do as well. There are days when she does 100%. There's no trend of any that we can detect. Uh, some days work better than others, uh, but you can see five days in a row, just selected actually many months in advance, uh, that she uh, was able to uh, able to do pretty well. And, and for somebody who can do nothing, to be able to point and click, this would be a useful function. And then here's, I think as you've seen, our graphics have changed, but this five years, I think this is running. So this is her five year. And I think this is a slightly different decoder, too. We actually, so we test different decoders at different times. This one is an adaptive decoder, I think, but I can't remember this particular movie. Is this with point and click or just? That one is just point and dwell, we call it. Yeah, she's not clicking. You'll see more clicking later. So I, I want to emphasize it doesn't always work great. Sometimes in the middle of the session, her control gets bad. And uh, so here's an example where this is the beginning of a session and everything has gone bad, uh, gone well. This is the paths are, 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 are not straight, but they're not bad. Actually, if you take an able-bodied monkey and look at how they do things, it's actually about the same. And then all of a sudden, she had this bias where she couldn't get the cursor down to these targets. You can see there's a, a lot of failure. This thing's hanging out up in the corner. And uh, afterwards, we went back and we found out that this cell, you don't have to see much, except somehow it's supposed to look exactly the same over here as it does over there. It doesn't. So it changed its properties. So we had a good model for these cells, but didn't have a good model for those. Something's changing. In this case, what was changing was the way we set our little discriminators to pick out neurons. But there may be biological properties that change as well, and that's something that needs to be investigated. So we are in the. So, so we've now made some progress in fixing some of these problems, but not all of them. And that. So that's a. I just want to make sure that everyone understands it doesn't always work well all the time. Sorry for the thousand day study. Were you recalibrating your decoder each day? Each day. Each day, yes. And how long does it take to calibrate? Four minutes. Yeah. It, it, actually, that's another thing we've we've uh, we've worked on, the, the way you calibrate, whether it's open loop or closed loop or mixed blocks and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, if this is ever going to be a product, as I pointed out, to the ideal product. Oh, I promised Jerry I'd point over here too. <laughs> Sorry. But but uh, the arrows point out what, what we have to get rid of the pedestal on the, the the thing on the head. We have to get rid of the technician in the room. We have to get rid of all these electronics. So um, I'll show you a concept diagram of a fully implantable system. Here's the array. There's a pad of electronics. The pad of electronics can transmit through the skin. It sits up on top of the skull. And uh, this is our concept of what we wanted to do. And we are developing this, but it's only in animal studies right now. But that's the actual object. In fact, I brought, this is not the actual prototype, but this is, the, the, this is one of them. In fact, this little pad of electronics, you can now take something the size of a DVD player and shrink it down to something that could be implanted in this little wafer that's about four times thicker than a potato chip, I think. That goes under the skin and that can transmit wirelessly uh, to the outside. So we're now, we have uh, a couple of animal tests, uh, you know, as, as all early technology, the first few broke, didn't work reliably, but we now have some recordings. So we're on the way to making a fully wireless system and this is all being done in collaboration with Arto Nermico's group. He has this brilliant set of engineers at Brown uh, who are 
Actually, they, it's an example of they were not contaminated by knowing anything about the field. <laughs> they violated all the early principles that everyone said wouldn't work, and in fact, it's all working. And it's working quite well, actually. I'm really impressed. So um, now I want to so just, just say that the, our goal really is to make this a useful device. So we've entered into a series of projects to, a step, to get, set up systems to communicate, to assist people in, in everyday living, to replace lost function or to restore lost function directly to the limb, uh, destroy, just restore function directly to the limb. So these are uh, either in-house or collaborative projects. So one of them is to develop a typing interface so that patients can type them. And uh, this is something that we're doing in-house, Lee Hochberg and, and um, Dan Basher are doing. And uh, another one is a robotic assistant. This is the idea that if you can't use your own arm to do something, you could control a robotic arm to do that. So this is a demonstration. This is a, a technician taking a drink uh, of water using this robotic arm. You'll get to see it in a, in a second in action. Uh, replace means that you would take a prosthetic limb and control it neurally. This is one of the world's cutting edge prosthetic limbs uh, developed by DECA. That limb is being controlled by switches on a shoe, not by anything in the brain. But we're now, the field is now looking at what is the best way to control this in the most natural way. Maybe the brain could be one of those. And finally, uh, an exciting and sort of the ultimate goal would be to connect the brain back up to the muscles via a stimulator. And this gentleman here has a stimulator implanted in, in, in his body with wires implanted in his muscles. And that stimulator is actually causing, he's a paralyzed person who's moving. And the way he's moving is he's wiggling his other shoulder which activates a switch, and that switch is moving his arm. But imagine now you could take the brain signal and go directly to a stimulator in the body. The brain would be driving the muscles, and you'd be moving just like you do, except it would go through real physical wires instead of uh, neurons. So those are ideas. I want to show you some results from the typing and from the robotic arm control. And um, the first is typing. And this is an inter but, so this is a standard QWERTY keyboard, and uh, this is Kathy typing. Yeah, she can't see her head at all. She's typing, and so she, she had the quick brown fox thing, but she changed it to lazy now or something uh, because she got tired of typing that. This has word prediction, so she's typing uh, the, the letters by pointing to a letter and then clicking on it, so she's using the mouse-like function. And uh, then when she sees a word that uh, you know, appears in the word uh, selection, she, uh, she picks it. Now, one of the problems is getting ahead of me a little bit. Let me just stop it here a second. One of the problems with a QWERTY keyboard is it's not optimized for one finger. That is, it's actually optimized for the opposite. It's meant to go back and forth because you're supposed to alternate between hands because back in the old days when you had carriages on typewriters and uh, keys, they would jam if, you, if they were next to each other. So the idea was to get things far apart. So that takes a long time to go back and forth. So Dan and Lee have come up with this radial keyboard speller, and uh, this is just the, the, the one that they developed. And she actually loves this uh, speller. And it, it's got a somewhat complicated uh, way of predicting. It predicts letters, the letters. Uh, and if she likes the, the, if she starts to see a word predicted over here, she hits the green arrow. And that, that puts the words in this, uh, this multi-dimensional uh, or this two-dimensional array here. And she can pick the, the word or the letter, whichever one she wants. You'll see a, a word come up. Let's see the words come up, and now she can select a letter by going to that quadrant and then uh, clicking on it. Uh, so she can type pretty quickly. So this is a, a useful interface, and it's good because she doesn't have to move very much, right? The, all targets are equidistant, so it's just optimized for, for pointing and clicking. Yes? Have you made any progress towards just taking the 96 time series and using them to build a, in this case, a 26 classifier so they can just do yeah that, so that's been tried in monkeys at about 15 it begins to collapse but you can't you know what what we don't want is we don't want her to learn an association between a means think this and b means think that we just want a natural to use interface so this is very natural but that that has been done already in monkeys to just do a state decoding yeah, just the same way you pick, I mean, the United States Postal Service mm -hmm. Yeah, but the neurons are not independent. So you need independent channels, and they're not independent. So that part is hard to do. So, so something like that, you could probably have it working both at the same time. That, that's, that's sort of next steps. 
And there are, Krishna Shinoy's lab, for example, is one that's working specifically on that. So, so the initial findings here that, that uh, you know, motor cortex remains active after injury, which Jerry pointed out at the beginning, is really striking that as soon as you think about moving your hand, the part of the brain that's been seemingly cut off from the body for, in, in her case, more than a decade, just is active again. And this has real, I think, implications for stroke, which she had, or for spinal cord injury. I think it tells us something about what are the cells doing, how, do they op op how are they operating in normal motor function. Uh, one is that, the, another important thing is that if you just think about moving, it, they actually fire, they modulate, you don't have to actually execute a movement. The, the system seems ready to use, it doesn't require learning, although it's very important, I think we have to look at next, how learning will improve or modify the functions. It's long-lasting, of course it's questionable now, we have an N of one, and Kathy it went five years, the other patients for other reasons it was less than a year, uh, one case it was 1.4 years. But in our monkey studies, it looks like these are lasting years. So there's a, it's promising, I think, that we could make devices that could last for years. I think we've demonstrated that it could be useful, that Kathy could have her morning latte in the morning. She could do some grooming, simple grooming. And we're hoping that uh, now that we're working in multidimensional robots, that we can actually get more control. Uh, and I emphasize, of course, there are many challenges that remain that uh, obviously we have to have a wireless system, we have to have it automated, it should be faster. The pa as soon as you do anything, the patient's always asked for it to be faster. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering about the low attentional demands. I mean, I know that in the case of the first patient, he could actually speak, so you, I mean, obviously he could converse while he was actually doing this, but, but how, how else do, does one assess that, I mean, in terms of... Attentional demands means they, they are not, well, so far in a crude sense, not intensely focused on doing that. So we can ask her questions, for she example. Seems intensely focused, she was, yeah, well, that was a big intensely right, focused right. thing. And, and uh, yes. Big moment. Right. Uh, so, in, for example, EEG based, it requires absolute. So if I go next to the person and go like that, it'll disturb the whole decoding. Okay. We can talk, we can, lots of activity going on in the background. That doesn't. Um, that doesn't disrupt control. And, and just like when we're doing things, if you're typing a manuscript and somebody is talking in the background, that can degrade your function, right? But if you're just sort of tapping on the keyboard and all by yourself, you know, that, that, that uh, it's not, not, a, uh, not a problem. So I think what, what I'm saying is that in, in other kinds of interface approaches that people are using, the attentional demands are very strong. So it's kind of a reaction to that criticism. So, and I think what what this is, begin is pointing to is that it has great benefit for people who are paralyzed and potentially people who have less paralysis than the severely paralyzed people that we've talked about. So these, the, the, the here I've just sort of done a summary of, of all of the places where neural interface systems seem to be going, where all of these neurorestorative devices uh, seem to have promising applications. So in stimulation, I already told you that uh, you know we can stimulate the brain, and in neuromodulation, we can help people with Parkinson's disease, um, and hearing and vision. Vision is coming along. I think they'll you know in some number of years, decades, there'll be people walking around with artificial vision able to see at least crudely, um, and there's a number of other applications of of stimulation. For uh, movement impairment, of course, I just told you how we can use uh, the, these devices as a neurorestorative. We can restore function. And then I think also using them in other disorders, now that we can sense the brain at this fine scale of its single cells, we can potentially use it in other applications. So one that's being looked at now is an epilepsy. So if you could look uh, at a uh, set of cells in the brain and the spiking properties, which are at this high grain resolution, could predict that a seizure is going to happen. You could, in fact, then uh, intervene in some way. At a minimum, you could tell a person, you're going to have a seizure in 10 minutes, sit down. Don't be driving a car. Or you could be, say, take medication. Or ideally, it is actually possible to mount drug pumps on the side of these hair-thin electrodes now. You could develop a closed-loop device that would squirt the drug only where you need it. So all of these are all things that need to be looked at, you know, that require a lot of investigation. But, but they're getting to the point of feasibility, and there are actually a couple of studies out now who have looked in epilepsy and see that there are symptoms of things occurring in the spiking properties that are not predicted by the other signals that are there. So this is very exciting and I think real promising. And these could be, if we knew the neurophysiological signature of depression or schizophrenia, we might be able to use it in those applications, but there's nothing known. 
Uh, someday there'll be an injured person that has depression and will actually get to see what happens in the brain during depression. So there's really a lot of promise in the future. And I think the other, the other important thing for all of us that are neuroscientists is at the same time we're looking at a functioning human brain at this population level and actually looking at what's going on. Uh, we're planning to look at you know, how plasticity drives change. We can actually do this in a population of neurons in a human who can cooperate with us. Do you think you could do it um, to read the words that she'd be thinking, and uh, I want to go and she'd have some machine that would speak them out? So the, yeah, so, so there's two questions there. One is, do we know the code for words in the brain? I, we don't. So uh, I don't think we do. Could we decode the commands that are going to the larynx and drive a device that could, that could produce those? So that's a guess. We know where to go. It's Broca's area. I actually predict that the, the neurons will give us some kind of muffled representation. So I bet it'll work, but we don't know. Um, so I just I want to point out this is a group effort. I'm only a representative of a bunch of really, really smart people, students and faculty. Uh, Arto Nermico, the engineer I pointed out, is a physicist and engineer. Michael Black, who's a computer scientist. Uh, Lee Hochberg, who's an MD-PhD neuroscientist, clinician, neurologist. Uh, and, and my own group, and that's just a bunch of us at the beach one day. But I think this is where neurology is going and what's exciting about it. And I think the combination of all these fields to allow, you know, all this to come together is very exciting. So anyway, I thought I'd just leave you with that sort of thought about the future. Thanks. Thank you. Why don't we have a few questions in here and then keep talking over wine and... Uh... Yes. So if you really want to operate a, not a robotic arm, but someone that had an injury, mm -hmm. so we don't understand how to stimulate the, the muscles? The there are 600 people with devices like that already implanted. And they have the same level of that <coughs> you get with the robot? No, body. they do not. Most of them have some residual function. They have spa partial spinal cord injury. So the gentleman you saw opening and closing his hand, so he could flex his elbow, but he couldn't extend, and he couldn't uh, open and close his head. So he was using stimulation. So what they do is they put cuff electrodes around the nerves that go to the muscles. They have a stimulator implanted. They have a box on the outside. And uh, that is, so they either have some kind of, they are right now sort of opportunistic. They may have a switch. There's one lady who has wiggles her ears. So they don't take the? the Not a brain suit. That's the project we're working on. But, but we've done this in simulation. That is, we've simulated that entire device. And Kathy ran the simulated arm. So what I, I'm virtually certain if we had a fully implanted brain device, we could have her moving with arm support in a plane, and she could be picking up with her own arm, picking up her coffee and bringing it to her face. That's about all we could do right now. David. You have 100 electrodes in a mm -hmm. field of neurons, which is many, many times larger. Is that the source of the inaccuracy and the waywardness of the control, or is there is it something else? No, I think, so, so we are, you know, making a very uh, almost arrogant assumption that we understand what those spikes mean, and we're interpreting them in some real-world external framework of a uh, Cartesian world of direction. And it's certainly not true. Uh, and we know that from trial to trial, the number of spikes varies. And we, we've actually gone in and looked at those spikes and see what else they correlate with. And we know from even animal literature, they correlate with the amount of force that's produced. They correlate with the position. They correlate with direction. They correlate with velocity. And so, um, and they also correlate across multiple joints. So it's really a, working in some very complex space. And we're very lucky that we can make an estimate of that in something that we can understand. But it's it's really only a you know partial reflection. So this. The trial by trial variation, I think, is one of the big problems that, uh, that, that does us in and why we get noise. And that's what we do with these algorithms is try to, you know, you, there's a trade off. The more you smooth, the more you slow it down. So that's sort of the, the, the trade off we have now. One more, and then let's go outside. Yeah. Go on. The EEG based BCI, you really do this comment. The what? EEG based mm -hmm. BCI. You then go get anywhere in your opinion? Yeah, so EEG based, I think, uh, the, the generally, the, the, Again, I was very careful to say, we want to recreate the actions of the arm. So if you want to get a switch-like control, EEG-based works. That is, you can put something on your head and you can get a switch-like state control. And you can take some learning to do it. You can even get sort of crude two-dimensional control. 
And there's, good, there's a whole bunch of toys coming up that actually, they record muscle activity. They don't record brain activity, but they look like brain activity. They're very popular and there'll be a lot of... No John, what the, ultimately the goal, I mean, to pick up this, which I didn't do in this box. <laughs> See, it's a hard problem. <laughs> but it requires coordination maybe between 50 muscles or so. It means inhibiting some, exciting others. So what is the goal here? What's the hope? Is it a smooth, coordinated movement, or are you just trying to affect primitive? For, for muscle, so, so I, what I, the point I was trying to make is there'll be a whole set of technologies. Just like in cardiac medicine, there's no one cardi approach to cardiac care, right? In this kind of, there'll be people who have ALS who say, I just want to switch, and I'll use a primitive typer. So that's fine, and no surgery required, just put it on your head, have someone put it on your head, and it'll work. Then there are other people who will say, look, I, I want a robotic assistant that can do things for me. So those people will do what Kathy has just done, is be able to drink her coffee in the morning, be left alone for a period of time, and be able to do things. I, I and then the ultimate... Idea, well, you, well, you need to connect from the brain to the spinal cord <coughs> to utilize the complex circuitry and the cord. So the... Coordinated movement. Pete Case Western is, uh, is, has uh, the group that is the leader of looking at being able to stimulate nerves and elicit coordinated patterns of movement. And it's really remarkable how well they can do. And what they, one of the clever things they've done is they put nerve cuff electrodes on, and they actually have multiple stimulating electrodes that can, and by adjusting the pattern across them, you can select certain fascicles and excite some muscles. And peripheral inhibit, nerves? Where peripheral nerve, nerve, peripheral nerve. And it's much easier to get out of peripheral nerve than it is to get into the spinal cord. So I, I predict, it's a great idea, but I predict that the difficulty of going to the spinal cord is so huge that it's not going to be done, maybe ever, but certainly not for a long time. This approach, as I said, there are 600 people that have this kind of, uh, it's called FES technology, functional electrical stimulation. And, and actually, the, they, they're doing pretty well. So there are people who can stand up, people who can crudely walk. It's pretty, pretty crude walking. But they're, they, they do uh, pretty sophisticated motions. They aren't as natural and fluid as what you or I can do, but they're the people who have no ability to move their arms are pretty good. Yeah, yeah, and you can see how hard a problem is. I'm going to suggest we continue outside. Thanks again, John. Oh.